Hello and welcome to You Asked For It. I am your host, Ann Page. I'd like to thank Sweet Dreams Furniture for this beautiful set today. I also want to thank the House of Logan for my lovely outfit and jewelry. And last, I'd like to thank Heidi at Hair, Bath Hair Incorporated for doing my hair today. Thank you, Heidi. I love it. I have a very exciting guest here today. He is a widely acclaimed author. His name is Philip Hoos, and he has written numerous books, stories, essays, and articles. But the book that we're going to be talking about today is this book, The Boys Who Challenged Hitler. Thank you for joining me today, Philip. Thanks for inviting me, Anne. I'm very excited about this book, and I understand that you started your professional career as an, an adult writer, but then you changed your genre to that of young people. And this book specifically addresses that. And could, could you tell us about it? Well, I, I didn't do it on purpose. And in a way, I, I just wrote, I wrote uh, three or four books about sports, uh, mainly, I guess, for adults. And then I had daughters and got involved in their lives. It's the first one of these books that I wrote was um, with my daughter Hannah in mind. She was a kindergarten student and uh, came up with the idea that rather than um, scrapping or bringing home their end-of-the-year art that they'd collected all year long, why not sell it, give the money to the homeless shelter, Preble Street in Portland, and they raised five or six hundred dollars and I thought, wow, this is terrific. There must be lots of stories of, of young people who are you know, making a difference. So I wrote a book. I uh, interviewed kids all around the world, uh, young activists, people who are trying to cause good change. And that led to a book about young people in U.S. history, uh, which led to uh, a lot of research in the civil rights movement. And I found one young girl, Claudette Colvin, who in 1955 had refused to surrender her seat on a Montgomery, Alabama bus to a, a white passenger uh, a year before Rosa Parks got famous for doing so. Um, and that led me to, uh, to more books, uh, basically for a, a teen audience. What intrigued me about that story when I studied about you was that um, that was a very little known story. And after you wrote, researched and wrote it, you won a National Book Award for it. So you really brought that story forth to the public. I think that was marvelous. Well, thank you. She was a wonderful person to, to write with and about. I didn't know what she was going to be like. Uh, I didn't know. I was looking for somebody who could remember really in two different ways, remember factually what happened and remember emotionally what happened, you know, what happened and what it felt like going through it. And not everybody can do that. In fact, I think most people have trouble with that. And she could, though. And she, she had a great sense of humor about her life. Um, she was very serious about what she did, but she, she saw it, you know, in a, in a great way. She could step outside uh, herself. She was wonderful. And I think if people go to your website, they can see, actually see a YouTube of her speaking about her experience. That's true. I saw it, and it was very moving. Yeah. So that, that was a wonderful book. Well, how did this story evolve? Can you tell us about this book and how this story evolved? Well, the boys who challenged Hitler um, started with a bicycle trip. I took a trip to Denmark in the year 2000. And on the last day of the trip, I visited uh, a war resistors museum in Copenhagen. And it was a great museum. And I stumbled onto this one little exhibit in a corner uh, in, in which uh, teenage boys who had acted as saboteurs um, in World War II and had really taken on the Nazis who, who occupied Denmark these, these kids were uh, featured, and there was a photograph, I remember, of these boys in a prison yard, each holding up a number. Uh, and I looked at their faces, and some of them clearly hadn't shaved yet. And there was um, a, a, a bit of information that claimed that these boys had been the first to resist the Nazi occupation, the German occupation of their country, and had sparked a, a general resistance movement in, in Denmark. 
And I thought, man, if that's true, that, that's just the kind of thing that I want to write about. I mean, I guess just for some background, uh, on April 9th, 1940, the Germans flew in uh, and occupied first Denmark and then Norway on the same day. And they dropped these green leaflets from the air and basically said, congratulations, you're a protectorate of ours now. Don't worry about anything. Uh, we'll protect you from the sinister Brit, the Brits and, and, you know, and the French. Um, go back to school, go back to work. Uh, you're in great hands now. Uh, and they flew on to Norway and did the same thing. And the two governments had opposite reactions. The, the Norwegians fought um, and the Danes did not, not at first. Why do you suppose that was that they didn't fight the Danes? Well, I mean, it was perhaps a very wise decision. I mean, I can't score the government for uh, saving their populace, saving the architecture, you know, all sorts of bad things could have happened. This was a huge, brutal uh, force. It would have taken a great deal of courage uh, and some would say foolhardiness to stand up to them. But, um, you know, I don't think it has anything to do with the, the Danish national character or anything like that. I think they made a very calculated, practical decision almost at once. They didn't have any time, and that's, that's how they went. That was the decision that they made. It, was it the king? It was the king of Denmark at that time? Well, the king of Denmark did sign uh, a document mm -hmm. basically saying, we accept your occupation, but it was really the political leaders um, in Denmark that, that gave in. So after Denmark accepted the occupation, how did the story evolve? Well, the story evolved just through the actions of these kids. There was, was one uh, boy in particular named Knud Peterson. He was 14 at the time, tall, artistic, you know, a passionate uh, kid who uh, just hated this, hated his government's compromise, um, thought it was uh, just a sin to, uh, to give in when their, their neighbors you know, uh, fought. Uh, the Norwegians fought, and uh, it just rankled in him and, and several other boys in his family and schoolmates, and uh, they just decided that, that they weren't going to accept it, that they, they would form their own cell, and they would uh, commit acts of sabotage and, and bring down the, the Nazis uh, in, in uh, Denmark. How did they carry out these acts? Well, they were very naive. It, it would have been, these were the, the upper middle class sons of the people who uh, ran the town of Aalborg in uh, Denmark, which is in the northern part of, of Denmark. And they had no experience, they had no military training, probably they had never shot guns, they were the, you know, one was the son of the city manager, another the son of a factory owner. They were just uh, upset and determined. And they figured, we don't know what to do, but we'll figure it out as we go along. And they, they all had curfews, so they couldn't be out at night a lot of the time. They invented a story that they had a bridge club uh, at, at the home of the one boy who didn't have a telephone. So that was one way they could get out a little bit at night. And they struck on bicycles. They, that was their big weapon. Uh, and at first, they really didn't know what to do. How do we make a statement? How do we become noticed? And uh, they decided that they would uh, snip telephone lines that went between the barracks and headquarters in Germany, or not in Germany, German headquarters in, in uh, Aalborg, Denmark. And they also uh, twisted directional signs around. When the, on April 9, 1940, when the, the Germans arrived, uh, they, didn't, they were in a strange town, a new town. They didn't know where anything was. So they, some of them, the advance guard, pounded in these directional signs. And the kids, the boys, would twist them around and send them the wrong direction, interrupt their communications, uh, vandalize their vehicles, smear them with blue paint. They had a an insignia all their own, which was a parody of the, of the swastika. They did the swastika and then they had lightning bolts coming out of each arm. They really didn't know what to do. And, and, but Knud Peterson, who was my main informant, uh, made the point that even actions like that, smearing things with paint and 
just vandalism, got you used to striking. It was a strike of a certain kind. You still had to control your breathing. You still had to control the, the fear that, that raged and pounded in you and, um, and make your, your body do these very dangerous acts, risking arrest, risking even perhaps execution in, in, in those times. Well, that's extraordinary. And wasn't Knud's father a minister of the claw? He was. He was. A, a, he ran a, a church in in town. They all lived in a monastery, a, a big monastery. And in fact, one way that uh, these these boys learned to shoot uh, weapons, they started stealing weapons, uh, mainly pistols, from Luger's from the. Uh, Germans would leave them in their coat pockets in a in a pastry shop that they all love, and these kids would run in and steal them. And they amassed quite a uh, an arsenal. They they had machine guns, they had rifles, and so forth. But they didn't know how to how to use them, and they had nobody to teach them or advise them. So uh, one place that they practiced was in the church in the monastery while the father was conducting services. And when the choir would swell, they would take this stolen machine gun and shoot it in the loft and practice, do target practice during, during these church services. Um, what extraordinary acts of bravery for absolutely. such young men. Yep. And considering that they were raised to be obedient and now they were doing all the sabotage. Please continue, I'm intrigued. Well, I, I don't know how they were raised, if they were raised really to be so obedient. The, the father's denomination was sort of like a UU church, sort of like a Universalist Unitarian church mm -hmm. now. It was liberal. Okay. And uh, they all opposed the Nazis. Um, a lot of people in Denmark didn't. There was money to be made. There was a great deal of commerce uh, to be made. The Nazis bought things. Uh, they didn't just entirely take, take things over. So it was a pretty sweet deal uh, for a while. Um, and as, as I said, you know, Reverend Peterson was, was a liberal, and um, I think, you know, when they finally found out what their kids had been doing, I think they were pretty proud of them. They should have been, they I can have. imagine. How old was Knud when you met him? When I met him, he must have been 86. Oh, amazing. And tell me about him as a human being. What kind of a person did you find him at 86? He was tall. He was about six feet five, and he uh, walked with a cane, but he didn't want to compromise any of his uh, six foot fiveness in the command that it gave, so he walked with the cane straight out. And he spent some time in prison uh, as a boy, as, as readers of the book will find out. Spent a couple of years, actually, and he, this, his prison experience had scarred him. He was claustrophobic. And I remember one day he wanted to take me to meet a, a publisher on the fourth floor of a building in Copenhagen. And we walked very slowly to the building. And then um, he would not take the elevator because, as I said, he was claustrophobic. And uh, it probably took us 20 minutes to poke, you know, stump our way up to the fourth floor uh, in there. But what he was like, he was very uh, smart and uh, Acerbic, and he was he was uh, a cost he had a caustic wit, and uh, very uh, very bright and very theatrical. He, there was a lot of neck wear. Um, he had a great head of hair, um, dressed uh, somewhat flamboyantly, but with with taste. And you know you knew you were with um, you know a heavyweight when you were with Knud Peterson. Exactly, and you must have really bonded with him because I think I read you spent about 25 hours with him. We did. Uh, I mean, the way I, I showed up, as I told you, I went to, uh, I first heard about the Churchill Club, as they called themselves, after Winston Churchill, whom they admired a great deal. I first heard about it uh, on my bicycle trip at that, at that museum. And then when I got home, uh, somebody gave me Knud Peterson's email address. I asked the curator, is there anyone still alive? And, and he gave me this email address. So I got back to Portland and emailed uh, Knud Peterson. Didn't know uh, whether he would answer or not. But the next day, there was an answer saying, this is lovely. Thank you so much for your interest in, in me and our work. But I've already signed uh, a contract for a book deal with another author. I can't work with you. Thanks a lot. 
So I wrote back and said, you know, if circumstances change, let me know. But otherwise, I look forward to reading whatever gets written about you guys. So never heard anything from me. Twelve years later, you know, I'm between books. This is, you know, 2013, I guess. And I was flipping through manila folders uh, with projects that I just stuff in all the time. And uh, there was one mark, uh, labeled Denmark. And there was one piece of paper in it, and it was the sum total of our correspondence the, that went back and forth. So I wrote that address, not really expecting the recipient to be alive, uh, but I said, you know, you still there? Uh, you know, want to work together? Has your circumstance changed? And, you know, right back across the Atlantic came an email message from Canood saying, uh, deal fell through, can work with you now, when can you be in Copenhagen? I looked at my address book and I said, October 7th, October 7th, I can stay a week. And he said, I'll pick you up at the airport. You shall stay with me. And, uh, and that was it. So I went with my wife, uh, Sandy St. George, to Copenhagen. There he was. There was no mistaking who he was. I'd seen photos of him before. And as you say, um, you know, his wife drove uh, and drove us to his his office, which was in the basement of an art library, he had established an art lending library. His philosophy was that art is bread, it shouldn't just be for the rich. So in 1952, he started a program of collecting paintings and getting permission from artists to lend them out for the price of a pack of cigarettes for three weeks at a time Incredible. with an option to buy them. He was a great man. He really was. But anyway, he, he took me in his office, shut the door, and we just looked at each other, and I turned on a tape recorder, and we launched. It was very difficult. It was very difficult for him. English was his second language. and Though he was eloquent, uh, it, you could see at, at 86 that it drained him. He was you know, just exhausted by the end of the day, and so was I. Uh, but we did that five days in a row, and we, we got to know each other. Something happened around Wednesday, you know, hump day, that, uh, that changed things in us. He, he grew to trust me. And I think we had enough uh, kind of contact points, having talked for three days, that things started to make sense to me on Wednesday that didn't make sense to me on Monday, you know. That's amazing. So the book evolved... And I've read it, and I love it, because it's a, a historical narrative, and it interweaves the stories of Knut Peterson in such a personal way. And you hear his voice as a 14-year-old child in the beginning of the book, and it inspires one to really examine their conscience about what is right and what is wrong in this world, and should you stand up and do something about it? So just absolutely extraordinary. They did, though, in fact, end up um, in jail. Is that correct? In prison. They did. I, I don't want to say too much about it. I don't want mm -hmm. to spoil the ending for you. Of course. For your viewers. Mm -hmm. And I'm the one who let the cat out of the bag right. uh, just a few minutes ago. So it's not on you, Anne. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they, they all did some prison time, and it uh, scarred them. Mm -hmm. uh, all, almost all of them, it scarred them uh, for life. Um, they had a, about a six-month crime spree in uh, Aalborg where their actions got uh, more and more radical. They uh, added arson to their, to their mix um, about halfway through it and started burning down office buildings of collaborators, cars that contained German airplane parts. Um, they, they were amazing. And... Uh, the Germans got more and more upset and told the, the Danes, who were still allowed to run their country. You see, Hitler didn't want to put boots on the ground in Denmark. He had bigger fish to fry. So he, he saw Denmark as the tiny next-door neighbor who uh, had fields full of, of crops that could feed their, their uh, soldiers, that had a marvelous uh, transportation system that could be used to bring ore from Sweden down to Germany to make weapons and so forth. But he, he didn't want uh, a fight on his hands, so he gave very uh, easy terms uh, to the Danes. But these, these boys were really messing things up. 
uh, for them. And the Germans said to the Danes, if you want to keep running your country, if you want this extraordinary freedom that you have now, find whoever's doing this and arrest them and deal with them harshly. And, uh, and I'll, I'll just sort of leave that to... Leave it that way. But how, in fact, did their actions inspire the country of Denmark? They, their citizens did know that these boys had created these acts of sabotage. Sabotage. And it yeah. did inspire the countrymen of Denmark. These boys got very, very famous. They yes, were they the topics of every dinnertime conversation in Denmark for a while, and many people wrote about them. Even though the Germans uh, censored the newspapers and so forth, word got through and they became uh, almost, you know, urban heroes or cult uh, heroes. And there was quite a lot of debate in the, in the Danish public. Uh, on one hand, some were saying uh, these boys deserve any punishment they can get, including death, because they've made things so much harder for us by bucking the Germans and angering the sleeping giant. Waking up the giant was uh, the way they looked at it. Others were uh, ashamed that it took youth to do it. Where were we? Why, why are our kids uh, doing that? And they were uh, very, very famous in, uh, in Denmark, the Churchill Club. Not only in Denmark, but that extended all the way to this country because there was a comic book that, That's right. that um, really honored their work. True Action Comics yes. in uh, 1943 did a, a comic strip about the, the Danish saboteurs, the boy saboteurs. That's the what they were saboteurs. called from Denmark. And they had blonde hair, and you could see the top of the monastery where they were in the background. Yes, that's right. They, they became world, world known. You know, I want to tell you the story that I, I had been to the dentist recently and I told him about your book. And he said to me, I have a 14-year-old son at home for the summer and I'm going right out and buying this book for him to read because I think it would be such an important part of his education. Well, great, Anne. Keep telling all those people who you just uh, <laughs> honored at the beginning of this uh, broadcast who did your hair. Yeah. You did a great job. I, got, I have, to, have to agree. Thank you. Well, I have to say that I think everyone should read this book, not just for children, but for adults, too, because it inspires and moves people to want to do the right thing. And, um, you know, an author could write a book on any subject, but... I really want to applaud you for choosing subjects that teach history, teach moral lessons, and inspire people. What a noble thing for you to do. Well, thank you. It, it doesn't feel like a noble thing to do. It feels like <clears throat> I'm a person who finds good stories and writes them. And I don't write for um, a teen audience or, or an adult audience or any audience. I, I probably write for the inner fill, you know. I, I just write. You know, but I the like thing stories. is that what you consider a good story is a story that teaches history and is inspirational, whereas other authors could write frightening stories or you know, scary stories or things of that nature. And, and so what you do is really important. And you know, this year and in this season in my show, I've had a lot of really talented people from the state of Maine. And Philip, you live in Portland, Maine. I do. I think that uh, you're just another treasure that we have here in Maine, and I'm really grateful that we live in a state that has so many people who are involved in the arts and people like you who inspire others. Well, it's one thing that attracted me to Portland. I, I grew up in Indiana and lived in the East Coast and various places uh, for a while, but I came to Portland uh, blowing through um, the coast of Maine on the way to Acadia. I used to camp there every year. And I, every year I'd, I'd look more closely at Portland as a place to live. It was, you know, the setting is magnificent. I, I like the look of the place, but mostly I like the feel of the people. There was a lot of art. There was a lot of activism. There was a lot of support for people who were doing uh, creative things. I love it there. Well, we're happy to have you. Well, thank and you. And you're contributing a great deal to our community and our state. So thank you so much for being my guest today. I want to encourage all of my readers, get this book. It's wonderful. I loved it, and I've been telling everyone all summer long, you need to read this book, The Boys Who Challenged Hitler by Philip Hoos. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. And remember, sweet dreams. Mm -hmm.